a wheel and there's like a, uh, there's a drone effect, right? So this music that sounds, uh, it's, if you think of like a, an organ grinder, that's almost what the music sounds like. It's really kind of crass, low class music and they call it in Germany a peasant's lyre in the early 17th century. So basically what he says is where you find uh, one note written on top of another, as in like a bunch of notes that you're supposed to play at the same time, um, uh, with this slur, this little marking over it that I've reproduced for you in the handout, um, that should be played like a lyre as one-eyed and blind beggars, right? It says blind people, but bl really what it means is beggars on the street corner. This is this kind of crass, low-class music that beggars have to play if they want, you know, they, it's like they're sitting in the subway, they're asking for change, right? Um, on the other hand, um, you know, then there are things like the organ, um, uh, actually, let's go, we could do the, yeah, so the, the organ, the organ tremulant. On the second page, I'll just show you briefly, uh, the tremulant is played only by, uh, by making only the wrist of the bow hand tremble. So there's a, a tremulant effect on the organ, makes it sound like wah, 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 wah. So here the violin is imitating the organ tremulant, this weird sound that can come out of the organ, by making the bow tremble and shake. Okay, so that's the, that's the organ effect. Um, then we get to these, um, these, the animal noises. So he doesn't say anything about the chicken or the rooster, but about the cat and the dog, he has quite a lot to say. So the cat is played by making the notes die. That is, by shifting the left hand so that actually the note will go from like meowing, right? So, and I'll play this for you in a moment, it's really funny. Um, by shifting the left hand backwards a little, um, then the 16th notes, the fast notes, are played ungracefully and badly. That is, by making the bow run up, 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 and, up and down, above and below the bridge, just as cats do when they scatter away, okay, or when they scamper away. So that's the, um, that's the cat effect. So there's all these different strange and un, almost unmusical sounds. Um, can we fast forward? So we're gonna hear, uh, two, three more sections. Um, so this is the trumpet. And sure enough, that is, we have some trumpet music from this period that's exactly the kind of music that trumpets were playing. He's not, he's not quoting anything specifically, but he's alluding to a general style. This is the kind of music that trumpeters play. Next slide, please. So this is the chicken. And here comes the rooster at the top. Um, and one more will be the cat, my favorite. And then they all run away. So that's, that's good music, right? Um, we can enjoy that. Um, it actually, this, this music actually, for those of you who know John Cage, this prefigures Cage by, you know, several hundred years, by 400 years, 300 years. Um, okay, so let's, let's, all right, so then, yes, pause. Here's the, here's the question then. I go into a classroom and I show my students what I'm working on, right? Because that's one of the things, and I'll say more about this in a few moments, but that's one of the things that I do as a teacher. As a teacher, it's my job to show them to give them kind of the latest knowledge, and that involves both what I am working on and what other people are working on, but in my, especially in my seminars at the graduate level, right, I'm dealing with students who are getting their, their doctoral degrees in music. Um, so we like to sit around and think about music. So I bring in this piece of music, and this is a true story. I bring in this piece of music to a class, um, and I say, isn't this strange? What can we make of this? And that's what I mean by asking the questions, right? So we're asking questions. So the hypothesis that I had at that point was simply that there is drama involved in this, that the violin is being used in this way that is 
kind of like what an actor does. He puts on different masks, he or she could put on different masks, probably it was he, uh, put on different masks and try, right, try out these different characters. Let's try for the moment being a consort of trumpets. Let's try for the moment uh, playing the guitar. Let's try holding our bow upside down. Let's try playing lots of notes at the same time. Um, let's try being cats and dogs and chickens and roosters. Um, and what would, that, what would that sound like? So that was my working hypothesis going into this class. And I still think that that is uh, an underlying, um, that, that's what enables this piece to exist. The, the idea that the instrumentalist can be dramatic. Okay? But um, a student of mine asked the following question. Why imitate a rooster? Like, why a rooster and not, for example, a more musical bird, a nightingale, a lark? And there certainly are, from other, other, in other repertoires, like you know, in opera, for example, there are lots of uh, moments where singers imitate really lyrical, sweet, beautiful music coming from birds. So why a rooster? So, right, this is, it's one of those kind of, you know, I, I don't know, I never thought of it that way. Um, and we kind of moved on, but I said, well, you know what, I'm going to try to come up with an answer. Um, and I went back to my computer. I don't, I have to tell you, you know, I hope I'm not going to offend my teachers here, but I never start inside the library physically. Um, I have three little kids at home, and I need to be able to do research from, uh, you know, in the middle of the night, uh, at home, in my pajamas. I, 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 if I'm going to go to a physical library, don't put that on YouTube, I put it in my pajamas. Um, but if I'm going to go to a physical library, I need to have a plan. I need to know exactly what it is that I'm looking for. And I do, right? So what I do is I start by using all sorts of online resources, and I can tell you a little bit about those in a few moments. Um, probably you already know about them, students in the back, you could probably teach me about them. Um, but I always make a plan. I always try to find whatever I can uh, online at home or using the books that I have at home before I set foot in a library. Um, that's a tip, a tip for research for everybody. Um, so yes, so I started looking around at what things were like for Farina, what things might have been like for Farina, this Italian composer living in Dresden. So he's in this German court, and I started finding a lot of stuff about music in the court of this king, this ele the elector of Saxony, he's basically a king. Um, uh, f started finding out a, a little bit about musical and artistic culture um, in the court of the elector of Saxony around the time that Farina was there. And actually there's a lot that has been documented about this, especially with regard to uh, with regard to opera and song and so on, but not so much about instrumental music. So I started thinking, okay, you know, this is, I can work with this, I'm going to do some reading, I'm going to see what other people have found, uh, find out what is the state of the conversation at this point, and how can I bring Farina's weird capriccio stravagante into this conversation? What can I learn from these other studies that have been done on related subjects? Uh, what can I learn from those about this piece that I'm studying? Um, so one of the things that I found out, um, this took a very long time, I have to tell you. This is something that went on. Um, I started this project in the fall of 2009, um, and I submitted it to a journal in November of 2010, and the thing was just published like two weeks ago. Uh, so this is a really long process, and there, this, this, that took an exceptionally long, long period of time. Um, it doesn't always have to take that long, but I can tell you some of, some of the reasons, I'll tell you in a moment, some of the reasons why it took so long um, for this piece of writing to, to be published. Um, but anyway, what I started finding out uh, was, after a long period, to make a very long story short, was that the Elector of Saxony, like many noblemen of his time, was a collector. He was a collector of some pretty weird stuff. Um, so one thing he collected was animals, for example. He had what he called a lion house, which actually didn't only house lions, it housed lions, plus all sorts of other exotic wild animals, live animals. 
right? So he had, he had like a little zoo, caged in zoo, in his, it, it, kind of on his grounds, okay? Um, he also collected plants, and he had a little house uh, for botany, where he would study, he had presumably a gardener on staff, I don't know that for sure, but um, he would study, and he, the, the elector himself would try to be involved in learning about uh, how plants grow. Um, he collected uh, gems, right? beautiful stones, precious stones. Um, he collected musical instruments. And actually, one of the nice things that I found, I found two, two really good, reliable inventories of musical instruments from the Elector's collection. And what I found also informed what I, what I then was able to put together about Farina's Capriccio Stravagante, that the musical instruments in his collection were meant to provide a kind of snapshot of the, of the instrument collections in the Elector of Saxony's uh, possession. Um, so that's one, one thing, is that he is giving this kind of tour of what is music like in 1627. Well, it, it uses this kind of music for peasants, this kind of music for princes, this kind of music for church, um, and all, everything in between, right? All these other, all these other musical instruments. Um, then at the very heart of the collection of the Elector of Saxony was a room, or actually a series of seven rooms, called the Kunstkammer. Um, German speakers, anybody? Kunst is art, right? Good. So, and Kammer? Chamber. Chamber. So it was a cha it's a chamber of art, or a room, or a series of rooms of art. And the Kunstkammer was a phenomenon that actually was well known in Germany, and the Italians also had their equivalent. But actually, the idea that you would collect works of art, and I'll say more about that in, again in a moment. I'm not talking too long. Um, the the idea that you would collect art um, was a, a pan-European phenomenon. It was all, all over Europe. Uh, members of the nobility would kind of show their class, their erudition, their intelligence, um, and how much in touch with things around them they were, how much they knew about the world around them. Um, that, was, uh, that was one of the things that they, that was one of the ways they showed their status. Um, so uh, yeah, the Kunstkammer didn't just house paintings, or even statues, um, or even little figurines. It also housed um, curiosities of nature, and curiosities of nature that were then modified uh, by, by, the, uh, by involvement by an artisan. So we talk about art as something high class and refined, but the, the English word artisan is related to that, right? An artisan is somebody who has a skill, somebody who does a craft. So, for example, a shoemaker is an artisan. Uh, a woodworker is an artisan. Somebody who mines precious stones or somebody who melts gold or something, right? Those are all artisans. And actually, the way that people in the 17th century thought about art was much closer to that idea of the artisan, that these are people who actually modify the world around them, change things in the world around them um, in order to interact with the world, in order to learn about the world, interact with the world, and kind of assert their place in the world. So the Kunstkammer became like a microcosm. It became a small world where the elector, or whoever the collector was, could go into this room and look around and understand his place in the world and understand kind of everything there is to know about, uh, about alchemy and magic and about science, like what is perpetual motion? Well, he had a little perpetual motion machine, right? We know perpetual motion is not possible, but actually he had a little machine that he was told this is a perpetual motion machine, right? So, and he had magnets, really, really, really strong magnets that could hold things, you know, could, could, could attract uh, metals 50 times their weight, 50 times the weight of the magnet. So these are curiosities of nature. And I have some of the curiosities of nature here to show you, little pictures of them. If you could go, go to the next slide, I think that's what I think it is. Oh, gosh, just for, skip this one. Yeah, thank you. So here is one of the, here's one of the, uh, the curiosities that the elector had in his collection. This is, a, this whole, um, this is the big stick with the sphere at the top, uh, is what's called a pyramid. It's made of ivory. 
So ivory obviously comes from, an, it's an animal product, right? It comes from an elephant. Um, but it is obviously crafted. It's taken, it's turned, it's called turned ivory. Um, and it is shaped by uh, the hand of the artisan, by the skill of the artisan. Now, at the, what it's depicting, this, um, this whole, the whole sculpture is um, at the very top of the sphere. If you, so the whole thing is actually a little automaton. It's a little machine. It's like a wind-up toy. If you look into the top, uh, into this little sphere at the top, there is a, a bunch of, there's a bunch of people sitting around a table eating. Um, and when you turn the machine on, they actually start lifting their spoons and forks and they're drinking cups, right? You have to, it's, again, it's Germany, so you got to have the beer. Um, so they start lifting their, their spoons and forks and drinking cups as if they're eating. Now, down at the bottom, we could go to the next slide. Hopefully, it's what I think it is. Yes. And this is a close-up of the bottom. And here is our consort of trumpeters. Here's our little ensemble of trumpeters at the bottom. Um, and sure enough, and in the middle, there's, a, there's this uh, timpani. Kind of, they're, they're, ke they're called kettle drums at this point. Uh, but they almost always went along with this band of trumpeters. So these are people dressed for a kind of stately occasion, right, these little guys. And down here at the bottom, um, there's a bunch of pages, right, little um, kind of messengers, people who are carrying with them uh, food for the banquet. So presumably they're going, to, they're going to go up the stairs, right, in this imaginary little world. They're going to go up the stairs and, you know, ascend the elevator, but not, right, um, to get to the top, and they're going to feed their, the food that they're bringing to the banqueters at the top. So when, so there's a separate mechanism, one at the top, two separate mechanisms, one at the top that animates the banqueters, um, makes them start eating, right, eating, and then at the bottom, uh, there's, a, there's a separate mechanism that activates trumpet music, the music that the trumpeters are supposed to be playing, and the pages actually start ascending the, sta the stairs. They actually start walking up the stairs. So this is, I, you know, there, there, are, uh, there are many more things to say about this, uh, about this piece, about the idea that you're bringing to life a little world. Right? I'll leave you with that. You can think about that. Um, you're bringing to life these little people, what that means. You're fabricating life in some way. Um, and then you're fabricating music to you. You're creating music through this automatic machine. The music is the music of the trumpeters, which we heard. That's what they would have played. OK, um, could we move on, please? And here we have our chicken and our rooster. So this is one of my answers to that student who asked me, well, why the rooster? Why not the lark or the nightingale?